Welcome back, everybody, to Raven Stars Witching Hour. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Raven, and I'm here with my very special guest and host, Brent Holland. And Brent, you there? I am. All right. And we Although did have... people would deny that. Some say I'm not all there. Well, you were finishing up with a very good point, and I hope you got to finish that. I know we were heading towards a break, but there's anything you wanted to add on from what we were discussing prior. No, I think I snuck it all okay. in. I think you did, too. And we do have a, a question in the chat from Deep Blue. It's, uh, can you ask Brent about Hunt's deathbed confession? Yeah, I'm looking for that right now in my okay. book. Now, I can't speak to the deathbed confession, but I do know about it. Um, essentially... E. Howard Hunt was a CIA agent. Many people might recognize that name because he was not only involved with the Kennedy assassination, he was also involved with Watergate and went to jail because of it. Mm-hmm. Um, he, was a, well, he was a CIA agent and he was no fan of JFK because he had helped set up the uh, Bay of Pigs and he felt a lot of his friends were unjustly incarcerated in Cuba afterwards because he was friends with a lot of the uh, anti-Castro Cubans. So he always had a thing against JFK. Now, on his deathbed, I think it was in 2005, if I'm not mistaken, he had made a tape to give to his son, St. John Hunt. And essentially, I'll have to paraphrase the tape, but he said that um, it was Johnson. Hmm. Uh, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But uh, what he told Mark Lane if I can just find a darn thing, come on, Brent, (laughs) was uh, E. Howard Hunt, uh, son, uh, St. John Hunt, told Mark Lane, and I'm getting closer, I'm getting closer. (laughs) Uh, A little music there, you know. We have an hour, you're good. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) Want me to sing Uh, to you? Okay. Uh, That'll that'll make it worse. Uh, (laughs) Okay, then over there. Oh, God. Sorry. It's all right. If you can't find it, you can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, It'll show up. It'll show up. It's when here you least expect it, about two in the morning, probably. Oh, God. Uh, witnesses. Uh, okay. Just let me read you this. Lane. Okay. Uh, Mark Lane says several shots were fired from the bullet, which hit him in the head. It came from his right front grassy knoll because, first of all, you see the effect on the president. He is driven backwards and to the left, number one. Number two, there was a police officer on a motorbike behind him who said he was almost knocked off his motorbike by brain and skull material, which hit him. That's behind him. That patrolman's name was Bobby Hargis. And there was eyewitnesses like Charles Brim, who Mark had interviewed when he was alive, and others who saw the same thing. They were standing right there a few feet away. So, I mean, you have all these witnesses that i think there was 55 witnesses that saw the sh- uh, felt that the, the shots came from the grassy knoll they saw smoke etc etc and uh it's pretty stunning oh, i just found it here we go uh so this is directly from my book so you won't have to buy my book anymore folks that's fine because i'm oh. going to be quoting <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of chapters That's okay. I had recently been talking to St. John Hunt. This is Mark Lane calling, uh, talking. And Mark Lane, folks, was uh, he worked with Bobby, as I said before, Martin Luther King, he organized for, and uh, was JFK's uh, New York City campaign manager. So he knew the Kennedys very well, and he definitely loved the Kennedys. So he goes on to say, um, I had recently been talking to St. John Hunt, who was E. Howard Hunt's son. She wrote and said, I could use this publicly, and I'm going to quote this. When E. Howard Hunt filed his lawsuit against the newspaper, he said, I was at home with my children and my wife for 72 hours after Kennedy was killed. I heard about the president being shot, went to the car, drove back home outside of Washington and stayed there with my wife and my children. So that's the official E. Howard Hunt recollection and statement where he says he was. St. John Hunt went on to say he was there, that is, St. John Hunt was there with his siblings and his mother and with an aunt. He, Howard Hunt, was not present, however. So he's lying. He, Howard Hunt, lied. Mm -hmm. His mother said to him, yeah, his mother said to him that his father had been in Dallas. Mm -hmm. So that's the wife of E. Howard Hunt telling St. John Hunt, the son, that his father actually was in Dallas on the day of the assassination. 
St. John Hunt said, when my father was dying, he said to me, Mark Lane was right. I and the CIA were involved in the assassination. I have to tell you that now. So there you go. Thank you. That's heavy. Yeah, that's uh, and the whole book is full filled with this type of, of of things. Not only about the CIA, but the mafia, mm-hmm. because they wanted back. They wanted back into Cuba so bad because they were making millions of dollars every year mm-hmm. off the casinos, and that was all taken away when Castro came to power, mm-hmm. and they were angry. Because wow. one thing you don't want to do is cross the mob. So when you get together, the mob, some really pissed off anti Castro Cubans. And the CIA and military intelligence, to a certain extent, bad things are going to happen. Right, like the president of the United States going to a parade and not coming home. Right. That's a bad mix right there, for sure. Yeah. 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 And, of course, Jerry B. made a good point. He said JFK was warned by his secretary not to go to Dallas. She was psychic, apparently. And he told her not to worry. And he, w- he knew he would not live to see a second term. Do you know anything about that? I don't. I don't know anything about that. Okay. No, I've never heard that before. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure where where um, Jerry B picked that up from, but yeah, it's fascinating if it's true. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm sure I they. I can have tell you this though. Um, Bobby Kennedy was working with Ted Sorens, and this is in 1968 when he was running to be president, and Sorensen warned him not to run. Hmm. Because he thought he was going to be assassinated. He wanted him to wait to 72. And Bobby said, no, it's okay. I'll be okay. Hmm. And worked virtually within days. He was shot. Now, Bobby Kennedy, folks, get this. Tell me this isn't an assassination. Bobby Kennedy was shot uh, from Sirhan Sirhan with a gun that holds nine bullets. There was 14 bullets accounted for that day. So where did the other bullets come from? kidding. Yeah, Um. so... Once again, it's the same template over and over again. Now, I had mentioned seven smoking guns. I'll give you your, your listeners another one. And this is another one from my book, folks. Uh, there was a fellow, a mafioso fellow by the name of James Braden, Jim Braden. In 19, 9, November 22, 1963, he was uh, picked up for questioning in Dealey Plaza moments after the assassination, and he was released. He had just changed his name, so no records showed up. Why he was picked up is because he was in an adjacent building to the Texas School Book Depository, just across the street, in perfect, perfect alignment with uh, the president's uh, car, and it would have been very easy to take a shot from there. As a matter of fact, that building is called the Daltex building, and in 1977, a spent shell was found on the roof of that building. Now, tell me that's just a coincidence, that you find a spent shell on the top of a roof of a building where the president had been shot. Mm -hmm. But wait, there's more. This fellow, James Braden, was found on the third floor of this Daltex building, roaming around And when the cops picked him up, he said he was just there in Dealey Plaza and was walking um, just, you know, like a tourist and asked what the commotion was about, was told the president had just been shot. So he was looking for a phone. Are you ready for this, folks? To call his mom and tell his mom. Now, this is a known mafioso bag man with 35 arrests against him. So... Many people think that he was involved with the assassination, maybe not taking the shot from the Daltex building, but maybe as a bag man, which he was known for, maybe as some kind of spotter. We don't know. Now, that's just speculation, but let me fast forward to Bobby Kennedy's assassination. Guess who was found lurking around the Ambassador Hotel only blocks from where Bobby Kennedy was was laying in his own pool of blood? Jim Braden, the same mm. guy. No such thing as anyway. coincidence. Well, it's, yeah, when do you stop, when is it, when does it stop being coincidence? Right. And when does it start being conspiracy? Yeah, and even, it's not even conspiracy, it's kind of like uh, assessment 101, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, I find it funny that people call it a conspiracy when in fact it's really not, it's just about breaking down what really happened. But they like to uh, kind of glorify that name and create this other 
kind of description, but we are talking about JFK assassination from the Oval Office to Daily Plaza. And once again, let everybody know where they can purchase your book. Oh, easy way to get it, folks, is uh, www.nightfrightshow.com. Um, there's also some documentaries I've put together. Uh, one on Abraham Bolden, the first African-American Secret Service agent that you can order from Amazon. And uh, you can get the book from Amazon as well, JFK Assassination from the Oval Office to Dealey Plaza. Interviews with witnesses and specialists, including the last interview with Ted Sorensen. That was JFK's friend and speechwriter. And the other documentary is First Person Witnesses, and that's told in their own words by a woman by the name of Beverly Oliver, the fellow I had mentioned before, James Tague, who was the third person wounded in Dealey Plaza that day and inadvertently responsible for the magic bullet. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Dr. Robert McClelland. And uh, it's dramatized, and uh, you'll really like the documentaries. They're put together. And uh, lots of graphic stuff in there as well. Sure, so. the listeners will appreciate that. You know, it's it's nice to have a benchmark of history that's that's more in alignment with truth versus the elaboration that was given to us back then. So, I agree, uh, and that's why I put the book together um, mm-hmm. because I knew I knew I had Ted's last interview, Ted Sorensen's last interview, and I knew it was historic because when I sat with him, I was down in New York City, folks in 2010 to interview three Nobel laureates, all women, by the way, Solaris, you'd be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll post the, I'll post them on Facebook for you too. Uh, Jody Williams, uh, Shirin uh, Ibadi, who was from Iran and um, uh, Marid McGuire, who was uh, won the Nobel peace uh, prize for her work in bringing peace about in Ireland. And of course, Jody Williams folks, is an American, and she won it for uh, banning. Uh, she worked with Princess Di in banning landmines. So, I mean, the incredible women. Mm-hmm. And then when I was down there, I called up Ted Sorensen's uh, secretary, and I said, any chance I could just do a quick meet and greet while I'm in here in New York City and meet Ted? Can I come by the office? She said, ah, oh, he's not in the office, but I'll tell you what. Give me five minutes, I'll call you back. Well, she called back in two, and she said, be at Ted's house tomorrow. Here's the address in Manhattan. By the way, virtually the building right next to the Dakota. And um, you can meet and greet with him there. So I went up to his apartment. The Dakota, by the way, is where John Lennon used to live and Yoko still lives there now. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, at this place, you're talking to a kid from the projects in Canada here, folks. (laughs) This place was unbelievable. (laughs) I mean, I walked in and there was a carpet and it came up to my knees. No kidding. Yeah. So it was just a gorgeous place. Anyways, Ted, Ted invited me in and I sat beside him and thank God something had told me when I got down to the lobby in my hotel room to go back up and get my video camera. And I put it on and I virtually have Ted Sorensen's last interview uh, which I'm making a documentary about, and he was ready to unload. Mm-hmm. I he felt so comfortable. He was relaxed. He wasn't in a suit and tie. He wasn't dressed up. He was just chilling. Mm-hmm. And he unloaded. Good. And what he unloaded was gold, mm-hmm. absolute oh. gold. So glad. And I, he confirmed conspiracy, but not a coup d'état. Mm-hmm. And that's all in the book. Right. That's fascinating. Wow. I applaud you for that. And good, good call. He brought your video camera. All right. Yeah, that yeah. was God intervening and saying, hello. <laughs> it's amazing how what you Canadians now. get into over here in the U.S., huh? <laughs> <laughs> it causes all kinds of trouble everywhere yeah. we go. Aren't you from Montreal? <laughs> Originally. Okay. You speak Originally. French then, right? Absolutely. Oh, oh, forget it. Dude. <laughs> Vous êtes très gentil, oh, it's mon nice. I, I need to learn French. Okay. No, you don't. Is it's it fine. Quebec or Quebec? Oh, whatever you want to call it. Okay, I've been I've been scolded before by people. I just wanted to make sure. I, I okay. have a host of other names for it because uh, it's a pretty racist place. Oh, um, that's too bad. Yeah, it's too bad. Uh, wow, you don't think of it as being like that, huh? Uh, well, I could tell you some horror stories about Quebec, uh, oh. where the police came. This is Canada, folks. Okay, you ready for this? It is illegal to put out an uh, English sign on your business in Quebec without a French sign twice the size right next to it. Brother. So somebody said, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put out an English sign with a French sign, but both are going to be 
equal. Imagine that, people being equal. He was arrested Hmm. for doing that. And he was going to go to jail for doing that in Canada. Can you imagine? Now, you know, there's a, there's a whole hell of a baloo about flying the American flag wherever you want. Mm-hmm. In Quebec, it's illegal to fly the Canadian flag without a Quebec flag right next to it. Oh, my goodness. You can fly the Quebec flag alone, but not the Canadian flag. Hmm. That's outrageous. It is outrageous. How long has that been going on? Oh, since 76. Good grief. Yeah. Wow. You cannot... You have to have a French name for your own business. If you were to move to Quebec, uh, well, actually, anybody that wants to send their kid to school in Quebec uh, into an English school. Well, let me clarify this. Okay. Anybody who's from Canada that wants to send their kid to an English school in Quebec has to apply to the the Quebec government for special papers. Wow. Which means if you piss them off or they don't like you, they can just turn around and say, guess what? You can't send your kid to the school of your choice. Mm-hmm. So if you, if any American moves to Quebec, you cannot, you have no choice but to send your child to French language school. Now, that's fine if the kid's five years old. Mm-hmm. But that's not so great if you're in high school and you've got one year left to graduate to go to college. Right. Unless you speak fluent French. Bingo. Yeah, my goodness. That's pure ethnocentric racism. That's unfortunate. Oh, well, it's it's abominable. So, yeah. you know, I get out there and fight every now and then, march and complain. Do you really? Oh, does God, it, yeah. Does it do any good? No. Uh, yes and no. I shouldn't say that. Yes, it does. Um, because you have to, as I said before. Mm-hmm. But the numbers just aren't there. It's not the civil rights movement. Um, oh, wow. And you need – there's power in numbers. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And unless, unless people unite, nothing is going to change. Right. And and now you're in Ontario, correct? Uh, correct. Yeah. I'm in a place called Kingston, Ontario. Nice. Which is a lovely, lovely place. And uh, it's right, folks, to give you a geographical location, right where the St. Lawrence River starts uh, from, the, uh, from Lake Ontario. It's nestled – Halfway, virtually halfway between Montreal in the east and in the west, Toronto. Mm. And this is virtually our version of, um, oh my gosh, what's that? West Point. This is where we train all our guys to be generals and all that stuff. So there's a Canadian Forces base right here. We're an hour and a half north of Syracuse. And I would say about 20 minutes from Fort Drum, uh, the 10th Mountain Division. So if there's a nuclear war, guess who's going? (laughs) Oh, no. We're toast. <laughs> You'll be okay. Hey, I, I'm in Colorado, so you know. <laughs> but you can just get under the mountain there. Oh, right. Yeah, sure. Let me in. Oh, I'm sure they would, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Just knock on the door. I'm sure That's they right. would. That's right. It's me. <sighs> oh, well, Solaris is here. Let's open the door. Yeah. Oh, we've got a file on her. Oh, oh, I'm sure they have one on me too. It's <laughs> subversive. Oh, it's so, funny. but it is a beautiful, beautiful spot. Oh, uh, yeah. It's called the Thousand Islands, and uh, virtually, if I look out the window, I can see uh, America. It's oh, just uh-huh. across the little river. Isn't that nice? And then, yeah, with yeah. all the drama that's over here, so yeah, I, I advise you to stay in your land for a while. <laughs> I don't okay. know. I'm hoping it gets better over here, but my goodness, I'll be heading for the border soon if it doesn't. Of course, you all wouldn't let me in, probably. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, really? Can I say oh, you're my God. relative? <laughs> oh, completely. Completely. Oh, I'm related to Brett Holland. Uh, yeah, it's Canada, see. baby. Everybody's welcome. Just don't go to Quebec. Oh, no way. Oh, that's too yeah. bad. I like. I always wanted to go there. I've never been. That's a bummer. Well, it's, Montreal's a wonderful place to visit, mm-hmm. but it's not what it was uh, in terms of its freedom, and it's unfortunate. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of the laws go against our Constitution, our very Constitution, but uh, the Supreme Court here says, well, you know, we have to keep uh, social unrest at a minimum. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyways, uh, let's hope that dies down, too. I think with the Internet and uh, more and more people are realizing that uh, it's just a, a bunch of baloney. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, ethnic, ethnocentric stuff just makes me crazy. I've got so many things in me. I've got Newfie, I've got Inuit, I've got Cree, I've got Scots Irish, uh, wow. English from England, and God knows what else is floating around. And there's even rumor that there's Jamaican in me, but nobody talks about that part. Wow, that's wild. 
it's so mixed. well it just makes me a human being yeah no i think it's good i think everybody i don't want to say we're mutts but everybody has a yeah, a lot of, lot of different yeah. heritage. And I mean, obviously, if you go through the centuries of ancestry, who knows what's in there? Precisely. Extraterrestrial, I'm sure. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, that is, yeah. But I always say there's only one race. There's the human race. Mm-hmm. race of and that's it. And unless you, you know, I opted out of the rat race years ago. <laughs> mm-hmm. Good so. for you. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I used to train at a really nice boxing gym and he had a sign up that said, no, no jerks allowed. Be nice to each other. And I think that's the bottom line. It's just, it's just be nice to each other. You know, you don't have to agree like you were mentioning earlier, but be decent, courteous, and, you know, just try to get along. How hard is that? Absolutely. You know, I had interviewed Jane Goodall. Now, there's a humanitarian. Oh, yeah. Of humanitarians. And I asked her, I said, Jane, do you have any religion that you follow? She said, yeah, the golden rule, which is essentially love your neighbor as thyself. Mm-hmm. And she said, oh, the other thing she told me that is going to be fascinating for your witnesses I had heard a rumor that she believed in Bigfoot, so I asked her that, and she does. Wow. She believes thoroughly in Bigfoot, and she said she's never seen the creature, but she's been virtually around the world in all these small secluded areas deep in the bush, and she said virtually every aboriginal tribe has told her a similar story. And this isn't solicited by her. They just come up and say, oh, yeah, we saw this big beast uh, that's big and furry that's not really an animal and it's not really a person. And she's got these same stories from right around the world. So she said there has to be something to it. Mm -hmm. So she's speculating maybe one day she's going to go in search of Bigfoot. And you know what? If anybody's going to find Bigfoot – it would be Jane Goodall, and she'd probably make peace with the beast. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she'd probably establish a conversation without a doubt. Without a question. Yeah, yeah that's fascinating. Do you get a lot of Bigfoot sightings up there in Canada? Oh, man, yeah, big time. Really? Uh, not a lot around here, but out in BC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for some reason, I don't know if it's the size of the trees or the fact that they can find cover easy. Mm-hmm. That may have something to do with it. I'm not oh. sure. Uh but, you know, there's a lot, especially through the Aboriginal folks, and right. we have a lot of Aboriginal folks up here, they have all these wonderful stories about Sasquatch and never a threatening story. Mm-hmm. It's usually they're very timid um, and they don't really scare. It's just if you come across them, they bolt. Mm-hmm. They run because they're very timid. And maybe that's one of the best defensive mechanisms they have because, you know, you always hear these guys going out looking for them with guns. Right. Yeah. What is that about? <laughs> you know, they, want a, they want a trophy, apparently. You know? Like, yeah. It's crazy, I'm telling you. Well, people are bizarro some days, I swear. Oh, man. You know, I'm beginning to wonder what's going on with the psyche of the mass collective because I'm like, wow. <laughs> I think that, that somebody dropped me off on this planet because I don't, I don't resonate with a lot of the stuff they do. But, yeah. You and me both. Yeah, I don't understand uh, the whole ISIS thing. I don't understand yeah. Uh, yeah. what Putin's thinking in this day and age. Yeah, it's really wild with all our technology wow. and even the black, you know, technology. You'd think we'd have a wonderful ascended world, both scientifically and spiritually balanced, and yet it's chaos. Oh, completely. So. At like never before. Right. And I often wonder if if it's a balanced thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, where the, the the dark is balanced by the light. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe the more enlightened certain people become, then the dark has to come up. Right. To balance that out, I, I don't know. Well, there's Which always is- a challenger. I, I, I would say energetically, there's always a challenger. The more you ascend in consciousness, the more you'll be challenged on a more um, spiritual level, is my impression anyway. So, But I think these guys can't hold the frequency. They can't handle or, or channel the frequency of light and consciousness and, and mm. love because there's so much judgment. And there's so much finger pointing. I mean, if you don't believe in their way of believing, then they execute yeah. you. I mean, what kind of garbage is that? That's, it's ins- that's insanity. It's I mean, suicidal. Yeah, I mean, no, no intelligent being would function like that. So I think, hit, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said intelligent. Yeah, I mean, really. So I'm wondering, is the water supply contaminated out there, or are they just mm-hmm. like being drugged with something? Mind control. It could go on and on. Who knows? But there's definitely a problem, and it's that's what's off balance is this um, this connection. What I call from spirit. So, you know, don't get me started on that too. No, that's fine. That's fine. But I was going to mention you some more questions about the JFK with the Oliver Stone movie, and I want to make sure we cover that too. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, but if there's something you want to mention, just chime in. Well, I was just going to say that, 
you know, I, um, I always question why when things are at their worst, people are at their best. Mm-hmm. And why it takes things to be at their worst. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, some kind of tragedy. Look at 9-11, for example. Mm-hmm. Things were just horrible that day, but people were so united. Right. Why the hell do we need a tragedy to unite ourselves? Exactly. That's, Good point. It's insane. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Oliver Stone movie. I was very fortunate. I, I interviewed all the uh, the folks who were the main um, researchers for Oliver Stone's movie as I'm flipping through the book trying to do two things at once, which I can't do very well at all, as you can tell. Oh, I'm better off. Just- <laughs> You're fine. You're awesome. Are you kidding? Yeah, Everybody's right. enjoying you. You're going to have um, to come back on my show. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Oh, great. Anytime, my friend. Excellent. Especially this late at night after I've had 20 cups of coffee. You know, oh, folks, I, I have know. to tell you this story. What time did I, I Skype you this, this oh, morning? I don't know. It was early, but you were on coffee then. Oh, yeah. I was slugging them back, folks, oh, one geez. after another after another because I knew I was going to be up <laughs> late. Uh, okay, this is a story from Jim Diogenio, and this is some background stuff about the movie uh, Oliver Stone put together, JFK. Jim Diogenio, folks, is he might be the actual most knowledgeable person in the world on the Kennedy assassination, and he was a researcher Oliver sought out to, uh, to help him uh, make the movie. And he tells this wonderful behind-the-scenes story of Kevin Costner, who played Jim Garrison in the movie Jim uh, JFK. And if you've seen the movie, right at the very end of the movie, there's a trial scene. And Kevin Costner is describing how the magic bullet drives through the president. And then he says, back into the left, back into the left. Well, Costner didn't believe it. And I'm just going to read this. So here we go. So this is Jim DiEugenio talking. Oliver took such a pasting on the movie, he wanted me to do an essay on the new documents that were being released. Okay. Um, By the way, since we're talking a little bit about the movie, I should say one of the immortal highlights of the film is during the trial scene when Jim Garrison talks about the single bullet theory, the magic bullet. Mm -hmm. And he says, devised by, this is Kevin Costner, he's quoting, devised by an ambitious Philadelphia lawyer named Arlen Specter. Here's a little bit, folks, of insider information. That actually wasn't in the script. But when they went down to film that scene, Kevin Costner was reading it and rehearsing it. And he turned to Oliver Stone and said, Oliver, come on. I can't say this. And Oliver says, what do you mean? He says, Kevin Costner says, come on. They didn't really say this that the bullet came in down here and then it went up here and zigzagged all around. He just simply didn't believe it. He didn't want to make a fool out of himself, right? So Oliver had to get his research assistant and she, Jane Rusconi, had to show him. No, really, they do say this. And she's showing him in the Warren Commission volume, that report. See, it's here. It's here. See, it gets in here. It goes out here. (laughs) So Kevin Costner goes... Who thought this idea up? And she goes, well, Arlen Specter. He was, I think, the senator for Pennsylvania, if I'm not mistaken. He's Mm. just recently passed away. And Stone goes, well, let's put his name in the script. So he rewrote the script right there and then put his name in the screenplay. And that's how he got in the movie. And basically the line is an ambitious young lawyer by the name of Arlen Specter fabricated the magic bullet theory. Now, Hmm. as a follow-up to that, I had heard through other researchers that uh, Arlen Specter was thinking about suing Oliver Stone, and he was also thinking about suing Kevin Costner. But then he, (laughs) being a lawyer himself, he said, well, I can't sue anybody if it's true. Wow, no kidding. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's kind of a fun little behind-the-scenes story. And there's a whole bunch of them. Jim Mars, folks on the – Everybody knows Jim Mars. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, he's uh, he's virtually the uh, the chairman of the board when it comes to research, mm-hmm. and uh, he was he's in the book as well. And I've got some behind the scene quotes about the movie from him. His book Crossfire, folks, was the book that was turned into JFK. JFK was looking for information on to, to make a movie about. 
JFK, and uh, a fellow in uh, in an elevator passed him Jim Mars's book, Crossfire, and said, "Everything you need to know is right in this book." And Oliver Stone turned around and made Jim Mars's book into JFK. Awesome. Yeah. So that's our very own Jim Mars. Mm-hmm. What an incredible guy. He sure is. Yeah. I've got to get him on my show sometime. Do you want to hear a funny Jim Mars story? Sure. It's not in the book, folks. I'm just going to tell you. I had Jim on the show several times, and we always have a lot of fun. And uh, two minutes before showtime, I said, Jim, I'll be back in two seconds. I'm just going to go get my coffee. And Jim looks at me, and he says, and we're on Skype so I can see him. He can see me. He holds up his glass, and he says, oh, I've got mine going already. He says, it's got a head on it. (laughs) That's our Jim Mars. Oh, that's so funny. (laughs) Uh, very seasoned, without a doubt. He's a great guy. I met him in Dallas last year. Just nice. a terrific, terrific guy. Wow, well, I'm glad you met him. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, Texas is an interesting area for, for certain, without a doubt. So so what are some of the myths about the assassination and, and why, I guess, why they aren't true? Well, one of the big myths that's floating around the Internet is that the driver of JFK's limousine, and that special uh, Secret Service agent, Jim Greer, turns around and shoots the president. In fact, he doesn't. He does turn around, but both hands are firmly on the wheel. Uh, the film, though, that, you know, when you put things on the Internet, it gets down downgraded and downgraded and downgraded, and it's probably a copy of a copy of a copy. The shadows and the lighting effects on the Internet make it look like Indeed, Jim Greer may have something in his hand and is turning around. But when you see a quality copy of the Sapruder film, you see both hands are firmly on the wheel and he is turning his head around to look at the president. Now, what happened there, um, Greer should have been gunning the car and not stopping it. And again, this goes back to what Abraham Bolden said, that they were just not alert enough. And had he gunned the car, as he was trained to do, as second he heard the shot, the mm-hmm. president would, would still be alive. Right. Instead of that, he stepped on the brake. Oh, brother. And nobody – because he, pan- he was just so dazed, I guess. So it was just, an innocent thing, right? It wasn't like they were um, asked to do that. As far as I know, it was an innocent thing. Uh, I asked Abraham Bolden if he – the first African-American Secret Service agent. I asked him um, – very specifically, if he felt that the Secret Service was involved with the assassination, and he told me, no, absolutely not, but they were known to have women around when they were supposed to be protecting the uh, Secret Service. They were drinking. It was like a frat party for them. Mm-hmm. They never really thought anything would happen to the president. Some of them had been up all night and not been to bed. They'd been drinking all night. Wow. And uh, there's a question here from the uh, – this Brent – have a view on Cyril Weck's view of the JFK assassination. Correct. Yeah, that's from Mark Eddy. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Mark. Um, just to let you know, Mark, Cyril Weck is booked to be on the show in two weeks. So let me just check the date so I have it correctly. Awesome. And I'd like you to call in, Mark, that day. Uh, September 20th or 13th? Just let me just check it. Uh, it's Tuesday night. My show runs every Tuesday night on Revolution Radio. And uh, from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And uh, indeed, where are you, Mr. Mr. Wecht? He's coming on. Not only will we be talking about JFK, that's yeah, the 16th, September 16th at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. on nice. Night Fright. Yeah, uh, it's Tuesday show. night. I catch your archives because my show, Hyperspace, is on. So, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I love your show. Thank you so much. Big time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This is going to awesome. cost me a lot of money, isn't it? Damn it is. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I, I do love your show, though. I do check your archives out. You had one on the Titanic. I really enjoyed that one. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Did I tell you that story? No. Oh, my God. Um, folks, in 2012, um, it was the 100th year anniversary of the Titanic, April, April 12, 2012. Was that right? I could have the date wrong. April 14th? Uh, 
No, it was 2012 because it was, I think it was 1912 when okay. it signed. I right. think it's the okay. April thing. I know it was in April. And mm-hmm. Let's just say it was April 12th. Uh, and people can correct me on this. I, I wanted to do a special on the Titanic. So I had this wonderful guest on that uh, had dove with James Cameron, who made the movie The Titanic, uh, on several occasions, made documentaries with him. And he's a PhD. He's a doctor. He's done all kinds of great research, not only on the Titanic, but other sunken things around the world. Well, the show was terrific. He was just an amazing guest. And um, I got these emails after from students, and this scared me. Thank you, Mr. Holland, for telling us about the Titanic. I had no idea it was a real story. I always thought it was just a movie. Mm. We're talking about Disconnect. But the classic oh. email of all times I ever got was the one that said, but what happened to Jack, which is the DiCaprio character oh, no. in the Titanic? Oh, yeah. Gosh. So there was a bit of a disconnect, but Holy that was cow. a fun show. Wow. So what do you think about the theory that the, the ship was switched Oh, yeah, I did a little thing on that. Um, I don't know. I don't okay. think so. Okay. I don't think so. I think in those days it would have been just too much. Mm-hmm. But one thing I did find out when I did a little bit of research on it, um, there was a mummy from one of the tombs in, in Egypt that had been um, taken from Egypt, put into a box, and shipped over to Britain. And the box got shipped over to Ireland because it was going to be put, snuck onto the Titanic Mm. and snuck across to New York City because they couldn't get it through customs and all that. So this rich guy had a a fancy car. And I mean, there was probably like three cars in the whole world at that point. um, Strapped the mummy itself outside of the box to the bottom of his car. Drove the car. Well, I guess the car was put on the Titanic. And there was a curse. And um, everybody, you know, speculates that perhaps the curse hmm. may have sunk the ship. Wow. Now, that's interesting. Well, a lot of people had premonitions about not getting on that ship. Very much so. As in 9-11, I know a personal story where uh, my sister-in-law's um, co-worker was in New York City. And uh, she had had a birthday party the night before 9-11 on the 8th. And she was on the bus on her way to the World Trade Towers, the Twin Towers. She got off the bus two stops later, went back to get some birthday cake to bring it to work. Mm. And she lived because of that. Wow. Isn't that wild, huh? Yeah, Yeah. no kidding. I just got another one here. I ran a – I thought it was a ran. (laughs) This is from Jerry B., by the way. I think it's a comment more than a question, but go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe he doesn't want me to read it. No, he can. Yeah, no, he put it in caps. Okay. I ran a security company from 1972 to 1974 and reported to the owner of a retired FBI agent. He told me on this deathbed that the real JFK files are sealed away in a safe. Wow. With a timer that can't be accessed really until 2050. I don't know. It's the first I've heard of this. Does your research collaborate, his claim? Wow. I don't know about that, but I have heard of a sealed letter that uh, Jackie Kennedy has written, and it can only be opened on the death of Carolyn once the kids are gone. Interesting. Now, what that letter holds, everybody speculates. It may be the truth. She may have been told the truth about the assassination. Right. Time now, I have, yeah, I don't know if that's true or not, but this is what I've been told. Hmm. Didn't she hire an outside intelligence agency to do some thorough research about his assassination? I don't know if she did, but Bobby Kennedy did. He did okay. his own research. And um, he, he, his first reaction, actually, uh, seconds after he was told that his brother had been killed in Dallas, he was virtually um, uh, at his home at Hickory Hill in Washington, uh, his first reaction was to go to the CIA and say, you did it. Mm-hmm. Isn't that funny? Wow. And uh, he also, uh, in, in the years after that, did his own investigation, and he found that the mob was very, very, very much involved, which only makes sense because Bobby was going hellfire against the mob and Jimmy Hoffa. Mm-hmm. At the time. Now, it looks like the mob 
probably didn't organize the hit. This looks more like a military CIA style hit. Mm-hmm. And that would make a lot of sense. But it looks like the mob may have financed it. Wow. Ugh, it just reeks of filth, doesn't it? Oh, it really does. It's uh, absolutely disgusting. Yeah, absolutely. it's amazing. It's amazing to me because there are a lot of people on this planet that wouldn't even fathom behaving that way and, and creating this kind of a scenario, you know. And he was so beloved, you know, like mm-hmm. it was his challenge to put man on the moon, quote unquote. And I remember that day. Yes, I'm that old, folks. Solaris. You're not much older than me. I have news. I looked at your birth date. So <laughs> you're like, what, five years older than me? <laughs> I remember the day they put man on the moon. And you know what, folks? For one split second, the whole world stopped and started to stop shooting their butts off of each other. And got out of themselves and realized we were united in the curiosity of putting a man on the moon. And that was JFK. For the first time in the history of mankind brought peace to the world globally for one split second. Mm -hmm. And it was his challenge to bring everybody together during that that period to put a man on the moon. That's awesome. Yeah, now they have a space war, you know, going on where it's like, you know, he who controls the moon controls the planet. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Like a sci-fi from hell sometimes when you look at what they're doing. Yeah, things have changed quite a bit. So I think it's time to balance that out and turn it around for the better. Let's hope there's some leadership. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we certainly need it. Yeah. yeah, we certainly do. I know we do. We're darn sure. Yeah. Now, that movie, The Legacy of Secrecy, is that out yet? Legacy of Secrecy, as far as I know, is supposed to be out this fall. Okay. Now, don't quote me, you know, don't take me to court on that, folks, because it was supposed to be out last fall. This is a movie, Legacy of Secrecy, that is based on um, one of the fellows I interviewed from my book, Lamar Waldron. His book was optioned by none other than Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. And uh, they're making a movie about the mob's involvement in JFK. Now, it was supposed to be out last year for the 50th anniversary, but uh, as you know, DiCaprio was in how many movies last year? Three major feature films. Mm. You know, The Wolf on Wall Street, and there was a couple more, um, The Great Gatsby. Oh, and there was another one he was in, too. There was three huge movies, and he just didn't have time for the fourth one. Mm. So this new movie coming out, uh, De Niro is going to be playing, I think, a Godfather-type Marcello. Uh, who is a godfather uh, type of character. And um, essentially what it is is the FBI from time to time will send an undercover convict in to a cell with a a big crime figure. And this is a true story. They did this uh, exactly, this scenario. And um, the crime figure was none other than Carlos Marcello, who was uh, the godfather of of, uh, New Orleans. And uh, he spilled the beans. He said, yeah, you know, I had Kennedy killed and it's all on tape. Mm -hmm. Now, the the FBI knew this in 1982, 1982, Mm -hmm. and they held it. They didn't release it to the public. No surprise there at all. So they knew and they just held on to it, just covered it all up. It's unbelievable. You know, what is the purpose of hiding all this data at that point in time? Well... (sighs) It's my thesis, and it was uh, corroborated, uh, that some of the missiles are still in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they don't – because Castro is still alive and he's a loose cannon, nobody knows what he's going to do. Actually, during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, he was pushing Khrushchev for a first strike against the United States. He wanted to release – the nuclear weapons he had in Cuba and attacked the United States. Mm. That's how nuts he is. Wow. Yeah. So him being still alive and God, I don't know how he's still alive, (laughs) but he is. Well preserved, I guess. Oh, geez. This must be the Cuban cigars. What about his son? Well, I don't know. Uh, You mean his brother, Raul? Is that what it is? I thought he had a son too, no? Uh, I think he has a daughter. Okay. If I'm not mistaken. Anyways, Raul is cut from the same cloth. He was part of the revolution as well. But he's not as bad as Castro. So I think they're going to wait for Castro to pass away. And um, then they're going to reveal the fact that there's still some missiles 
left in Cuba. And I've, I've had that corroborated, by the way, uh, that there is still some there from several different sources. And that's all in the book as well. That's fascinating. Well, so that, that's part of the reason for the cover up. The other part is I think nobody know, nobody's left that knows the truth anymore. Mm-hmm. I think they've all died off and taken their stories to the grave with them. Yeah, most of them have. Yeah, so we're still piecing it together. And like I said, even the president doesn't have top secret clearance. Mm -hmm. What the hell is that about? Who knows? But I think he has a little more access than most presidents. At least I get that kind of vibe. Um, But who knows? Yeah. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I believe he was trained by CIA. So you've got got CIA connections with him. Is that right? Yeah, he might have some some extra access that that most people wouldn't have in his position. Don't quote me on it, but that's my perception anyway. Okay. okay. Yeah, but yeah, it's just, you know, it's weird. And you, when you look at what's going on across the board here on this world, I mean, we could be easily involved in another nuclear war or another one. But I mean, literally, we could have some bad things happening if we don't get these people to chill out. Well, here's a scenario that's very frightening. You know, the Russians have crossed the border into the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. If somebody retaliates from the re- Ukraine, just a lone nut, quote unquote, lone nut uh, gunman Mm -hmm. goes and shoots Putin. Well, then Russia's going to go in and take over the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And of course, NATO's going to respond to that. And then what do we do? Yeah. It's going to escalate very quickly. Within 48 hours, we might see ourselves at a nuclear standoff. And if one side starts to lose in a conventional war, you can be darn sure somebody's going to push a button somewhere. Right. Well, then you've got North Korea, too, who is just like completely unstable. Ugh. So, I mean, that guy's a mess. Oh, it's ridiculous. It's nuts. I can't yeah. believe these people. I mean, I'm just like, it's just like some sort of a strange warped movie <laughs> or a Twilight Zone <laughs> episode when I look at it. But and yeah, you got these guys marching around like the Taliban, no music. That's right. it. You know, you have to wear a burqa or we'll behead you. And oh, yeah, no school. Let's throw some acid in little kids faces because they want to go to school. And they're yeah. girls. I think oh the biggest goodness. thing, you know, we don't want to see a bleed through effect coming over here in the United States. And it's my it's my impression that the U.S. right now is wide open. I hope I'm wrong. I really, really do. But I'll tell you point blank, man, I feel like we're wide open for, for an attack. And I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about 9-11 coming up here in the United States. Yeah, it's coming up all too quickly. I had interviewed Colonel Robert Darling, who was in the White House bunker on 9-11. And that shows in the archives, too, if, if you want to watch it, folks, www.nightfrightshow.com. And uh, he was saying the uh, the threat assessments that were coming in fast and furious. There was a threat that there might be a nuclear weapon in Washington. There was a threat that there might be a nuclear weapon in a container in New York City. They didn't know what was happening. They were caught with their pants down completely. Mm-hmm. They were absolutely freaked. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's just run the energy for good things and shielding instead of all this craziness. Well, I think a global prayer is in order. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, mm-hmm. I totally agree. To combat yeah. this evil that it's, uh, that's just running rampant. I don't think we've seen this since the 30s. I swear it feels like the gates of hell have been opened, man. I've never seen anything like it. This is it's like... Unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. And it's, uh, you know, it's. I'd like to look at each day as more of a positive thing versus this kind of drama that keeps on. It's just like an infestation. It gets worse and worse. And you have to ask, at what point does it stop? So, or does it? Yeah, that's just it. Or, so. Are we on it? Are we so destructive that we will end ourselves? Well, a lot of people see it like that. You know, mankind going extinct, and uh, you know, just just don't know. But uh, you know, let's hold the, the big, vision for higher things, right? Well, you know, in the bigger scheme of things, the dinosaurs were around for thousands of years. Mankind's only been around for six thousand, mm-hmm. or so we we presume, and that's right. that's like a, a little blip. In the, in the whole time zone, you know. Well, that's if you look, nothing. and another thing is, Brett, if you look at the the type of technology that the United States has grown pretty fast when it comes down to technological advancement, and also the black programs that nobody talks about. So mm-hmm. you've got a you've got a pretty advanced uh, organization here in the United States that's not that old, and with that comes you need maturity, you need spiritual evolution. In my opinion, you need a balance between science and and spirituality, and I don't see that. So I think that's what's that's causing these issues. Yeah, I agreed. Completely agreed. I think we've outgrown our uh, our ability to control it. Mm-hmm. Totally. You know, we'd just be feeding itself. Yeah, it's like a monster. It's mm. ridiculous. Well, yeah. we're getting ready to wrap this up soon enough, but I do want to continue on. And once again, let everybody know how to get your book and, oh, and sure. your radio show and all that great stuff. It's been wonderful to have you on tonight. I've so enjoyed having you here. 
You're very sweet, and I've enjoyed it immensely. And by the way, uh, Solaris is coming on too, folks, my show. I am. And yes, she is. You can't get away from me, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. And that's coming up on uh, September 30th, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is. I believe so. It's going to be great, folks. We're gonna... Oh, belated happy birthday, by the way. Oh, you're very kind. You're very kind. I was born on the cusp, folks, August 23rd. And uh, that's right between the, the annual retentiveness, as I call it, of Virgo and the fire of Leo. Oh, good what God. a combination. Good well, God. Take eh? the best of both worlds. There you, know. you go. You've got the analytical Virgo. That's good, actually. And the showman of the Leo. There you go. Oh, I should say it's September 23rd. I just rechecked it. Okay. So 8 o'clock to 10 p.m. September Perfect. 23rd. Cyril Wex, September 16th. And um, we're doing uh, – Robert Salas is coming on the show this Tuesday. And Great. we're going to be looking at his book, which is called – Unidentified the UFO phenomenon. Awesome. And that's going to be great. Uh, I love yeah. doing shows on UFOs and getting some esoteric thought and thinking outside the box and the possibilities of what's going on. Oh, absolutely. Well, how about the UFO sightings out there where you are? Do you, do you see a lot of anomalies? Not in this particular area I'm in now, no? which is odd. But the city I moved from Montreal to originally, a place called Sudbury, which is a mining city in northern Ontario, the sightings are oh, almost one a night. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I'm in touch with a friend up there who's the MUFON representative for Ontario, and he lives up there. And I asked him why, and he said he thinks it's something to do with the water, mm -hmm. the freshwater lakes, because virtually every 10 feet there's a freshwater lake. <laughs> like I said, we have the most fresh water in the world, folks. You should keep that quiet, Brent. <laughs> you might get an invasion. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> not if they privatize it no I was just kidding well I don't think water is something that uh, I think it belongs to all the people I, I agree well if you hear person. Nestle's and, and what they're talking about it's just insane once again so yeah corporate greed it truly is but yeah, yeah that's interesting so so there are anomalies out there and, and oh, paranormal absolutely. too right you've had um, some ghost tales out there as well oh some very creepy ghost tales mm. uh, as well as uh, Christine Corda came on the show and she went through a real Roman Catholic exorcism, and that scared the bejesus out of me because that's the real deal. Wow. I mean, for the Vatican in this day and age to sign off on a real Roman Catholic exorcism, which happened with her, mm -hmm. wow. Uh, and the way she described the demons um, speaking in tongues and all the things, are, and it's the real deal, folks. I'm not kidding. There's something there. Wow, I don't know what it is, and God knows I don't know what it what, it, what it is. But the what way about, she oh go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was going to ask you when you do when they do an exorcism, where does the where does the entity go after it gets exercised out of the uh, the target? I guess it's this. You know, I guess it goes to hell. That's I mean, what, does it does it go and hijack somebody else? Is my question. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I, I guess it's only speculation. Right. Um, she uh, she underwent some horrible horrible abuse when she was a child and she thinks that because of that her uh, defenses were down and the entity just uh, entered her and uh, it was a priest that that caught it and sent her through all these tests and everything to make sure it wasn't psychological wasn't physical mm -hmm. and everything came back negative and uh, they said okay let's do a, an exorcism they did it and um, the way she described the demon was the exact same way I had a demonologist on that they don't know each other. I mean, there's zillions of miles apart and they have no contact whatsoever. Same way the demonologist described it mm -hmm. and scared the bejesus out of me. Mm. Really did. Well, very, very scary you, stuff. Do you get spooked by your stories? Did you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, huh? <laughs> but I'll tell you the <laughs> one story that scared the hell out of me the most. I live in a place called Kingston, as I mentioned before. We have the maximum security penitentiary of the whole country here. This is where we keep the worst of the worst of the worst. And like any country, we have serial killers. Mm -hmm. And they were virtually housed right down the street from wow. where I am. And the only thing separating them from me was some armed guards and some brick wall. And then that was it. Oh. And that scares me because these guys are sick individuals. And, uh, well, the Barbie and Ken killers were there. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah for the real deal. So. Yeah, well, well you should have a good surveillance system set up around your house then. Absolutely. Be armed, yeah. mister. Do something. 
something. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, circle of light. Well, that works too, but yeah, lock and load when that doesn't. But, <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's been so wonderful to have you on tonight. You know, remind me to tell you when I'm on your show about electronic possession, something they can do remotely hijacking the uh, the neural circuitry. I'm writing that down. Yes. Right that's. I'll, I'll send you a documentary. I'll send you my documentary too on on my control and covert technology. So. Oh, I'd love to do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but, but that's it. Kind of parallels into the the natural possession versus a simulated one, done by technological advancement. Well, I'm really looking forward to this. Just got yeah, me, me too. It's going to be great. It's going to be great, have, folks. You got to join us. Oh, absolutely. And is there anything else you'd like to add? Because I know we're getting ready to wrap this up pretty soon, and I want to make sure I've covered. I, I went through the majority of questions, but if there's anything else you'd like to include. No, I you know I just welcome people to to listen to the show, support Revolution Radio. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, I, I know, you know, uh, money's tight. There's no question. But the work that folks are doing on this radio station is phenomenal and it needs to be supported. Uh, give what you can. And uh, it, it would be much appreciated because, as I said, democracy is that precious little gem and we really do have to support it. And this is a great way of doing that. I so agree. And the work you're doing as well. I applaud you for this JFK um, book that you have out. And I wish you the best of luck with it. I know it's going to take off. And I'm going to leave you with this. Merci beaucoup. Vous êtes très gentil. Mon amour. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Stay tuned for Shiny Side Out with David Dunter and Mekki coming up next to Celia to the night. All right, everybody. Take care. See you next week.